Did you know that one in every five Americans has a brain or nervous system disorder, according to the NIH, and that being sedentary increases the risk of dementia by 30%. Thankfully, exercise reduces the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's by 15 to 20%, depression and anxiety by about 25% also. However, are certain types of exercise better for improving brain health? Well, if we understand the mechanisms through which cardio versus resistance training impact the brain, we can then use that to come up with the best protocol for using exercise to improve your brain health. So let's run through this today. To start off with a note of optimism, quoting from the Journal of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry 2023, being physically active at all time points in adulthood was associated with higher cognitive performance and verbal memory scores. The longer an individual is active, the greater the impact on cognitive function. So this is great news, but it begs the question, how does exercise impact the brain? What can we learn about cardio versus weights, how they impact the brain, and then use that to come up with the best brain exercise plan, if you will? Well, firstly, and probably not surprising, but there's some interesting data here I want to share with you. When you exercise, you improve circulation to the brain. And along with circulation, perfusion, or the ability of oxygen and nutrients to get into the tissues of the brain. And if we look at this um, 2008 observational study from the Journal of uh, Physiology, there's a really interesting observation that shows us direct evidence that exercise will improve blood flow to what's known as the MCA or the middle cerebral artery. And that's what you're seeing in this schematic. So why does the middle cerebral artery matter? Well, you've probably felt in your neck, your pulse, right? This is your carotid artery. As we go upward, the carotid bifurcates externally to supply the face and neck and then internally to supply the middle cerebral artery. And this is one of the main blood highways, if you will, for supplying the brain. So if we can show improvements in the velocity of blood through this artery, we know that we're getting better blood supply to the brain. And in this schematic, what you're seeing is MCAV, middle cerebral artery velocity, and it's 17% better in those who are trained or exercise as compared to those who are sedentary. So we see improvements in one of the main blood supplies to the brain when you exercise. Along with that, when we exercise, we know that we release a number of growth factors. You may have heard of this compound known as BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's nicknamed miracle Grow for the brain because it's so powerful in improving brain growth. And similar but different is another compound known as IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor one. Now, insulin sometimes gets a bad rap, but you need insulin. This is why type one diabetics, they can't live. You literally can't live without insulin. Now, yes, on the other side of the spectrum, too much insulin can be a problem. But for growth, we do need insulin and we also need insulin-like growth factor one. Now, when considering growth factors, it would stand to reason that exercise through improving levels of growth factors would then lead to improvements in brain volume. And thankfully, this appears to be the case. Exercise appears to directly improve brain volume. Looking at a 2011 randomized control trial in aerobic training, so sedentary people who then started aerobic training, 
they found improvements in the volume of the hippocampus. And this is the next image I want to share with you. What you're seeing is over time, two groups of people have the volume of their hippocampus plotted out. And I'll tie into why the hippocampus is so crucial in just a second. There's two lines. Those who start exercising see an upward and to the right improvement or a higher volume of their hippocampus. And those who are sedentary, you see the line goes down and to the right, meaning they are literally losing brain volume, specifically the hippocampus, over time because they are sedentary. So what compelling evidence this is. Now, the hippocampus is chiefly responsible for regulation of memory, specifically conversion of short-term to long-term memory. And in disease states like Alzheimer's, you will see a diminishment of hippocampal volume over time. Now, this was in aerobic training, but we want to ask a question, might we see similar benefits from resistance? And this enters a 2017 randomized control trial where, good news, they found in sedentary versus those who lift weights or other sorts of resistance training, maybe it's bands, maybe it's body weight, they have better hippocampal volume than those who do not exercise. And that's what you're seeing here. There's two bar graphs. Green is those who exercise. You clearly see a higher volume and those who are sedentary have a lower volume. So thankfully here, we see that either type of exercise can lead to improvements of the volume of the hippocampus, this crucial center of the brain for learning and memory. The other thing we should mention outside of blood flow and some of these growth factors is this compound known as osteocalcin. And when you stress bone, you will lead to an improvement in cognitive function directly in part governed by the function of osteocalcin. Taken collectively, we might be able to state sort of loosely that aerobic training could be superior for blood flow, blood perfusion. And it seems that as it pertains to hippocampal volume, either type of exercise work or works. And as it pertains to osteocalcin, excuse me, there's probably a favoring toward weight training. Although, even if you're doing body weight with some dynamicness to the movement, you should stress the bone enough to have the release of osteocalcin. And by the way, if you're enjoying the video, please like, subscribe, or comment. I'd be curious to hear what you think. And this helps us reach and get in front of more people. So it would be deeply appreciated. Okay, so then we come to what type of exercise is best, aerobic or resistance? Again, we could probably conclude that aerobic will be the best for circulation and for brain-derived neurotrophic factor. And we can also conclude that resistance is probably the best for insulin-like growth factor, for anabolic effects, including osteocalcin, and even for grip strength, which is directly correlated with all-cause mortality and with cognitive function. But we want to look at hard outcomes, meaning there's all these mechanisms and weights or resistance might favor some, cardio or aerobic might favor others, but how does it summate? How does it summate to cognitive assessments over time? And this is where I found a 2023 meta-analysis extremely helpful because they use sort of this global cognitive assessment known as the Montreal Cognitive Assessment. And in this assessment, they will examine executive function, attention, abstraction, short-term memory, language abilities, amongst a few others. So at least in my view, this is one of the best ways to ascertain the summative effect of all these mechanisms that we know are 
facilitated by exercise. Does someone have better name recall, better verbal fluency, better high level executive function to solve problems or to see how various points of data could lead to a problem or create a solution? Now, also to be careful and a little bit cautious, the Montreal kind of assessment is chiefly uh, administered to populations that have what's known as mild cognitive impairment, MCI. So it is a group of people who are starting to see some faltering of their cognition. Can we broaden this out and say this applies to otherwise healthy people who are looking to have a bit more productivity in a day or maybe be a bit more quick-witted? Maybe. It's a little bit speculative, but I think it's a fairly safe inference for us to draw. And it's certainly, in my view, the best evidence that we have to pull from to answer this question, which is how do we load exercise appropriately? And this is part of what uh, this 2023 meta-analysis helps to answer. So what they did in this study that found improvements in the, con in the uh, Montreal kind of assessment was a combination of aerobic training and resistance training was what improved all the domains of this kind of assessment score. So then we can go one step further and we can combine or combine a few different studies that have looked at this to give you kind of a meta protocol. And what I've done for you here is combined a 2021 review paper along with a 2019 meta-analysis to summate down to what your weekly goal should be for resistance and separately for aerobic. And this appears to be at least the best protocol recommendations we can put together with the one caveat understanding that there haven't been very elegant studies that have meticulously compared one sort of weight or resistance-based program versus aerobic to compare results over time. But we can look at the data on the macro level, looking at these benefits across multiple trials and summarize to the following. For resistance, you want to train two to three times per week, three to six exercises per session, three to four sets per exercise at a moderate intensity and make sure across those two to three times per week, you hit all major muscle groups or you essentially do a total body workout, not in one session, but across your week, across the two to three sessions. And make sure that as you get stronger, you increase the weights over time so that you maintain this moderate intensity. It's important to know that once you start doing anything for a little while, your body will acclimate and you've got to keep increasing the load because if you don't, things will feel really easy and you will drift into light intensity and you need at least moderate intensity. Now, as it pertains to aerobic training, one important note is that it should be continuous, meaning you want to try to avoid doing some cardio, resting, recovering, doing more cardio, resting, recovering in a given session. So continuous in nature, you're aiming again for two to three times per week at a duration of equal to or greater than 40 minutes at an intensity that is moderate to high. So then in summary, two to three resistance, two to three aerobic, and this gives you the sort of macro and then some of the micro parameters we just went through for how to set up your weekly training to optimize brain health. Also to those who are highly meticulous, don't trip over your own feet here, meaning this is a general aim. It's important to keep in mind that old saying, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. So do your best. Anything will be much better than nothing. And here's what you can be trying to aim for progressively over time. Now, one other thing I just wanted to call out to be on the lookout for is signs and symptoms of overtraining because there is such a thing as doing too much. And then you may actually see cognitive function regress as part of this picture of overtraining, which can include any combination of the following, aches and pains, poor sleep, low energy and mood, and poor performance, just to name a few. And also bear in mind that the context can determine if you're going to be more or less at risk 
for overtraining? Did you just have a child? Are you not sleeping that much? Are you under a lot of work stress? Are you maybe trying to cut your calories lower to optimize body composition? All of these things can aggregate to make you more susceptible to overtraining. So if you start noticing, hmm, my energy and mood are kind of low, I'm not sleeping that well, I'm having aches and pains, I'm having poor performance in the gym or poor performance cognitively, make a mental note of that and you may want to consider shaving down some of those sessions off your week so that you can recover. Uh, and that's it. So this hopefully will help you have some aims with your weekly exercise so that you can enjoy the sharpest cognition possible, uh, be witty and have a good mood and uh, be as healthy as you can be over time. <laughs> <laughs>